Welcome to the Clinical Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Here in our PCRF Journal Club, we promote evidence-based practices by critically evaluating the latest science in emergency medical services. We hope our discussion will help advance EMS practice. Through the generous support of our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO, we are able to make science more accessible and understandable. Hello and welcome everybody to the October 2024 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Special thank you to our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO, for making it possible to be here together today during the spooky season. And we have definitely have some scary good research for you all. I'm Rimley Crow, and today I'm going to be joined by Dr. Tony Fernandez, Jeff Rollman, and Dr. Bill Toon, and we are fortunate to have with us members of the authorship team from this paper, including Dr. Kathleen Camp and Brandon Pate. So welcome, everyone. As a reminder, the name of the article that we will be reviewing today is Integrating Fall Prevention Strategies into the EMS Services to Reduce Falls and Associated Healthcare Costs for Older Adults, published in Clin Clinical Interventions in Aging. As always, our discussion is paired with an article in EMS World called Journal Watch. And this is written by our very own columnist, Michael Caduce. Encourage you all to go ahead and check it out. It's at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. And for all of you who are here with us live, thank you for being here today. Uh, as we begin, I'll remind you, you can contribute questions, discussion points at any point throughout this webinar. You can put them in the chat and we will bring those into the conversation as we go. All right, so with that, let's dive straight in. Thank you to our authors for being here. I think it would be great if we could kick off with some introductions. Uh, so perhaps we could talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, how you got into EMS research. And I can start with you, Dr. Camp. Yeah, welcome. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, so yes, my name is Dr. Kathleen Camp, and I'm actually a physical therapist here at the University of North Texas Health Science Center, and I work in the Center for Older Adults. So um, falls is a big topic in our clinical care and and, and even in my practice. And, and so I've been glad to be a part of several teams that are interested in, in promoting fall prevention. And one of those was an exemplar um, program MedStar that um, uh, was part of um, some programs that we had here. So it was really great um, to be able to partner with MedStar on their implementation of fall prevention. And um, so again, yeah, I'm here in Fort Worth, Texas. So glad to um, join today and sharing this great article that uh, we collaborated on. It's always fantastic to see the blend between where EMS intersects with others, with other disciplines. So really excited to hear more about this. But Brandon, let's hear a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how'd you get into this EMS research thing? Yeah, sure. So again, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Brandon Pate. Um, I'm an operations manager here at MedStar in Fort Worth. I primarily oversee our mobile integrated health team and our critical care team. Um, and I've, I've been here for about 12 years, been in EMS for 20 years, ever since I took this role as um, the operations manager. I've had the opportunity to partner um, with several different academic partners um, there at the Health Science Center um, at TCU, and then also a um, UT Health Science Center out of Houston. Um, and so working with, you know, the academic leaders at those different agencies and organizations have really helped us to prove value and, and propel these initiatives further. So thanks again for having us today. Awesome to have you and awesome to see EMS clinicians involved directly in research about our profession. Such an important thing to do. Um, and no easy feat, which I'm sure you feel after getting this paper published. Uh, so Dr. Camp, you hit on the topic of falls. And for our audience, I it would be great to hear a little bit about why are falls such a big deal for older adults? 
Sure. Yeah. Well, obviously it's, um, can be very devastating to their loss of independence, right? And that's really where older adults want to remain as long as possible. And so falls, uh, whether they're occurring or they're just a concern, it can be quite paralyzing to an older adult um, and maintaining that independence and maintaining a desired lifestyle. And we know that for older adults, you know, some of the factors that influence those falls um, are associated with those conditions. So we know that someone ages, they become uh, visually dependent um, on that information to help them uh, maintain balance. So there's a lot of conditions that can impair vision. There's a lot of conditions that can impair sensation. Um, and obviously mobility becomes more and more challenged uh, for some people as they age, especially if there's several comorbidities. And so that can be a challenge. And where uh, Brandon and his team really focused their attention were those individuals still living in their own home environment. And we know that home environment has a big factor as well. So I think they were in the ideal situation to be literally on the front line of seeing older adults in their home environment, uh, having awareness for some of those medical conditions and challenges. Um, and so I think their ability to address those risk factors is just phenomenal. So, um, so for us, you know, as caregivers and as clinicians, uh, we love it when we know that there's community programs out there that um, will c collaborate with us, right? And, and that we can even turn to, to sort of be those extra eyes literally in the field uh, to take care of the patients that we take care of in the clinic. Absolutely. And, and EMS often is that intersection, the group that sees patients where they live. Uh, Brandon, perhaps you could describe just a little bit before this project, what were some of the challenges that you were noticing with your organization in helping patients with things related to falls? Sure. Um, so primarily, there wasn't an easy way to document the fall risks um, for, for my team, the mobile integrated health team, or even for our 911 uh, team members. Um, and, and so there was a lack of awareness to why this is important. There wasn't a way to, you know, document it, to follow through. Um, there was no, you know, mechanism to identify that a patient was at risk for falls. Um, or if they noticed something in the house that could contribute to the risk of falling, there, there was no really guidelines or instructions as what to do with that information. It was, you know, you call, we haul, that's all. <laughs> type, of a, type of a mentality prior, prior to this, this project and this study. Yeah, and that has been a mentality where I think EMS is starting to pivot to more community-based medicine and going upstream to address some of these drivers that are, are causing poor patient outcomes. And I know we get geeked out about things like cardiac arrest, but when we think about something like falls, how often this is occurring in our communities, there's such an opportunity to have a large impact. And I'm really excited to talk about this particular study where you all describe the findings of implementing a screening, which you mentioned was a challenge you know, with existing national standards, and then the follow-up care that was provided to help address not only what happens after a patient falls, but to actually prevent the falls from occurring in the first place. And so I want to dive into that study a little bit. I'm going to invite Tony Fernandez to come on uh, and go through the methods with us a little bit. Uh, but this is just such a a high stakes topic and I'm, I can't reiterate enough how excited we are to have you all and, and thank you again for sharing your time with us on this. Well, and I want to thank you also for joining us today. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting uh, discussion and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, so your project was really interesting. And um, before you started your initiative, uh, it looks like you put your paramedics through a really interesting training program. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that training entailed? Sure. And I think you're referring to the Geriatric Practice Leadership Institute. And that was one that uh, we had a HRSA grant, um, a, a federal grant for us to um, help 
you know, clinicians and professionals in the workforce address some of these um, primary issues with older adults, one of those being falls. And so Brandon and some of his uh, teammates uh, early on actually um, dedicated the time to come to training. And it was a lot about, we know it's one thing to identify an issue. It's another thing to, you know, design a plan and implement it. Um, and so anytime change comes into the workforce, there's always pushback, right? And so a lot of the training was really how do we sort of take this idea that we have and get buy-in, buy-in from our, you know, not just leadership within that um, organization, but the people that are on the, you know, the, the ground floor, the roots of just, you know, implementing it. So the training had a lot of sort of training those people that came to the Institute about how to implement change um, into their workforce and what that would look like. Um, and we partnered each of these sort of teams up with a coach um, that could help guide them through this sort of implementation and integration and adoption phases, and then also how to measure the impact of that. So then it turned around and it did speak to the higher leadership to say, see, this has value. We're contributing, we're saving dollars, we're saving, you know, maybe even lives. So um, so it's got, you know, again, the training and the opportunity for them to, you know, sort of um, get that ongoing support, support for sustainability as well. And then obviously to disseminate it to others so that they could maybe even duplicate it and implement it as well. Yeah, and I'm sure that was a great experience for your for your medics as well. Um, so your initiative, you consisted of two parts, uh, and one of them was to identify the higher risk, uh, patients for falls. And the other was to refer and enroll some of these high risk individuals into some relevant, uh, MIH type programs. Um, and you did this, uh, within MedStar and for any of our listeners who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about MedStar and the population that you serve? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, um, MedStar... Uh, mobile Healthcare is the exclusive emergency and non-emergency ambulance service provider for Fort Worth and 13 surrounding cities um, now. Um, so we serve a population of 1.1 million over 434 square miles. Um, we do about 190,000 911 calls every year. Um, and in addition to all of those, you know, 911 calls, a traditional EMS response, we also have a very large team of community paramedics who are working in that mobile integrated healthcare space who can go out and do follow-ups after 911 calls. And, and so that, that piece of this was very important for that follow-up mechanism as we are identifying, you know, the older adults that are at risk for falls. Sure, absolutely. And so we talked about the two parts of this initiative and one was to help your paramedics understand how to identify these patients for enrollment. And can you tell us a little bit about how they went about uh, screening and identifying the patients? Yeah, absolutely. So within, as, as part of the, the this process and that quality improvement initiative, we actually built out into our EMR um, validations and flags and criteria for if a patient is 65 years old and they're at home or they're at an assisted living facility or they're out in the community, um, and uh, as in a, like not they're not in a, a skilled nursing facility, but they're in a home or an apartment, um, it'll automatically bring up the stay independent questionnaire from the CDC study toolkit. Um, and if clinically and situationally appropriate, you know, and then the patient has the capacity to, to go through that questionnaire with them at the time of the 911 call, um, regardless of what the 911 call is for, they'll, they'll go through that um, and, and kind of identify if that patient is at risk for falling. And even at the time of the 911 call, they can share that result with the patient and be like, hey, hey you might need to follow up with your primary care about this and or pre-alert the nurses and doctors that are receiving that patient at the ER. Very nice. And that, and you also had, um, in, you enrolled patients uh, through, from, through some hospital referrals. Sure. Um, can we dive into that a little bit as well? Yeah. So as a result of that screening, if a patient is identified to be at risk for falls, or maybe they have um, some environmental factors in the home that would predispose them to falls or, or put them at a higher risk for falling, um, the patient gets the opportunity um, to be referred to our MIH program for follow-up. And, and they're asked at the time of the 911 call, we can have one of our community paramedics come out, um, do some additional assessments, um, and then refer you to resources in the community. 
And outside of that, we also do work with the hospitals and, and different payers, different insurance companies who are referring some of the same patients over to us to, to go out and do those proactive home visits, try to mitigate that fall risk, address you know, some of the factors that are contributing to them being at a higher risk for falling. Yeah, and you had a, a couple of places where, uh, well, I guess they're not places, but <laughs> they didn't put them somewhere, but there were groups that, uh, that your patients went into. So particularly if they were... Uh, experienced repeat falls. Um, you had a program for those patients and you also had a program uh, to prevent readmissions. Um, can you talk to us about those? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So um, regardless of if, if they're falling a lot, if, if they're just calling 911 frequently, um, obviously they have some sort of unmet need. Um, and typically it's a health related right. social need, or it could be because they're falling. Um, and so we kind of put them into our high utilization group program which consists of two proactive home visits a week by one of our community paramedics over a period of 90 days. Um, and so they're, they're gonna be going through a lot of validated assessments and screenings just to see what are the drivers to this increased EMS utilization. Um, is it food insecurity? You don't have transportation, you don't have access to your meds. Um, and as part of that, we're doing the fall risk assessment from the CDC study toolkit. Um, and then we do get referrals from hospitals that are, th those referrals are, you know, primarily focused on preventing a 30-day readmission just to get that hospital off the hook for that. But we're still doing some of the same things. We're still getting two proactive home visits per week. We're still going to go over those validated assessments and screenings um, and, the, and the fall risk assessment with them and then provide that resource connection to, you know, other organizations that are, that are in the community that are able to fill some of those gaps that were identified. Uh, and really interesting and sophisticated program. And the, the way that you went about uh, studying and telling the world about your results were interesting as well. So you did, this was a retrospective study uh, and you looked at data from 2019 to 2022. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yep. And then I thought it was really interesting the way you tracked patients and you the way you collected these data. Uh, can you talk to us about how you track patients, particularly how you followed them? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that happens whenever we go out for that initial follow-up visit, this is after the 911 call, this is one of our community paramedics is going to do an initial intake visit or an initial enrollment visit with a patient so that we can connect them to resources in the community. One of the things that happens is once they're enrolled in that program, our EMR pulls a year worth of their 911 calls. And we can filter that down to why are they calling? Is it because they're falling? Or uh, are they calling you know, primarily for social needs? Or maybe they're calling frequently with uh, difficulty breathing because they have unmanaged asthma, just as some examples. And then we continue to monitor that 911 utilization while they're enrolled in the program. Um, so it's 30 days to 90 days. And then once that 90 day mark is over or that 30 day mark is, is done, we graduate them from the program, but we continue to track their EMS utilization for a year beyond that graduation date. Um, and with that data, we can show, hey, they called this many times or they fell this many times in a year leading up to the enrollment. Um, and then a year later, we we're able to do a look back and kind of see how many times did they call, how many times did they fall um, in the year after they were graduated from the program. Yeah, I really like that word graduated. Uh, it, 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 they they really did kind of accomplish something to make their life better after going through this program. So I thought that was uh, a really cool way to term that. Um, so your outcomes you had you didn't you didn't just look at this one way. You looked at a whole host of outcomes to see if this if this initiative was uh, uh, as effective as you had hoped. Um, can you walk us through some of your outcomes and how you measured those? Yeah, so we already touched on the 911 utilization and how we've kind of tracked that over time. We also looked at ER visits, um, hospital utilization, 30-day readmissions. Um, we looked at what was the, the financial impact of reducing those calls, reducing that number of falls among this population. Um, but we also looked at quality of life um, for those patients. We did a quality of life assessment when we enrolled them. And then we repeat that quality of life assessment when we graduate them, just to say, hey, we're not only reducing EMS utilization, we're not just reducing the number of falls that are happening, but we're actually improving quality of life for the older adults in our community. 
I love that because there was a whole, you looked at how it impacted uh, provider level, right, and readmissions and the like, and you looked at how it impacted the patient with their quality of life, and then you looked at how it impacted the payer. I, I thought this was a really nice mix of outcomes to really get uh, a robust look at the uh, importance of this program. So um, I want to commend you for that. Um, and I, uh, before we move into looking at some of your really interesting results, uh, I wanted to open this up to some of our other panel members to see if they have any methods related questions. And again, thank you really for uh, publishing this. I think it's a really interesting study. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, Dr. Camp and Mr. Pate, this is a very well-written study. You definitely explained what you did really nicely and definitely amazing work that y'all are doing in the Fort Worth area. So I certainly appreciate you not just doing this work, but also publishing it and sharing it with everyone, including in an open access format so that we could all read about it easily. So two uh, clarifying questions. First of all, I was wondering if you could just speak briefly about the training involved. So on our podcast, we have folks who are from many different types of EMS agencies across the country, and they might be thinking, hey, that's awesome, but we can't do this here. They probably spent hours and hours on training, and there's no way that's feasible. So if you don't mind just briefly speaking about what sort of training is involved, both on the 911 emergency paramedic and then the community paramedics in terms of initial and ongoing and then my second question was um, was about the partnerships. If you could just speak briefly, since it seems like a really key component of this is it wasn't just EMS in a silo, but working with folks at the Health Sciences Center and other health professions as well. Um, so that'll help us kind of put those results in context. Thanks. Well, you know, I think if you're referring to the training done um, at the offset to, to do this initiative, um, again, that was um, some training that we were able to provide here at the university as part of um, some funding from the John A. Hartford Foundation. And so um, that uh, training also went through some changes because even before we launched that program, at one point in time, we were meeting in person. And as most all things do, they transitioned to virtual uh, during COVID. And so we offered that uh, virtually for a while there as well. Unfortunately, we don't have that training still ongoing, but many of the partnerships and the collaborations and the initiatives that were started at that time, those relationships are still ongoing. So it's really exciting to hear uh, about what they're still doing within their practice. But um, I do feel like that maybe having that leadership training and maybe just having that background really gave them um, some tools to move forward. But one of the initiatives that I just want to give kudos to uh, Brandon and his team for that is still out there is um, they all integrated this sort of with the um, backdrop also of uh, age-friendly healthcare delivery uh, using the 4Ms framework. And that is still out there and active um, within the community. And, and actually Brandon and his team were the first uh, EMS unit to get recognition as committed to uh, care excellence uh, for initiating this project. So age-friendly health systems um, implementation uh, and using the age-friendly system is is um, still out there uh, and available, and I'll be glad to sort of post that information in there and uses utilizes a lot of the tools that Brandon and his team did to kind of create a framework of what we were going to implement, how are we going to implement it, and how are we going to measure change over time, and so um, and that's available. Primarily, and I'll, again, I'll say through different settings and was more consistently uh, created to support uh, clinicians and providers uh, in uh, outpatient settings, hospital settings, things of that. And I've encouraged Brandon and his team that we need to keep pushing forward because they are a great role model of how you can implement this actually in an EMS system, uh, which is a little bit different. So look for maybe um, that toolkit to come uh, maybe authored by their group. Um, so, and then of course, Brandon can speak more to how they then brought it into their team to sort of train their team to actually implement it into their sort of standard of care.
Yeah, of course. Um, and so the CDC study toolkit and the, the stay independent questionnaire, it, it is very user friendly. It is very um, easy to review with the patient, you know, at the time of the 911 call or during a scheduled home visit. Um, and so as part of that training with the Geriatric Practice Leadership Institute, the implementation of this new project was covered and was planned for. Um, and so we did set aside, you know, training sessions for um, initially just for our mobile integrated and in healthcare providers, our community paramedics, um, but eventually rolled this out to the entire field, um, to our entire EMS crews, our entire EMS staff, which was, you know, several, three, 350 EMTs and paramedics who are, you know, have this toolkit with them, have this built into their EMR, um, doing this on a daily basis. And, and to answer your question about some of the other partnerships that we forged along the way is, um, as you suggested, we can't reduce falls by ourselves. It certainly takes that community approach. Um, and so we can go out and we can identify the risks. We can identify, you know, the environmental concerns that may contribute to a fall, but we're not carpenters. We're not <laughs> master carpenters for sure. And so we can't do any type of home modifications. Um, and so we do have built a network of resources in the community um, from agencies that will do that home modification to physical therapy groups, to home health agencies. Um, and then we work very closely with primary care, um, just to loop them in on what we're seeing, loop them in on some of the potentially inappropriate medications that may have been identified as part of our, our home visits, um, identify those medications that, that may contribute to one's fall risk. And so it really takes that collaborative approach um, we're just the eyes and ears, and we can share that information with a number of stakeholders to make a difference. That's really good to hear. Yeah, thanks for answering those details. And I imagine training hundreds of paramedics and EMS clinicians was not an easy feat, but uh, you were able to really get buy-in and make this work. So looking forward to talking about the results. Yeah, and I, I think I would add on one thing is, you know, we, we do the training, and everyone's like, it's just more work for me. It's just more work. I have to click all these extra boxes, go over all these extra questions. But then we start to show them what the outcome is and then I start to show them, hey, this is the reason we're doing this. This is the impact that it's having. Um, and then they do, and then the EMTs and the paramedics do have that buy-in. And then it becomes embedded into our culture. Um, luckily, we're at a, an agency here at MedStar that has been very innovative over 15 years um, doing the different you know, MIH initiatives. Um, and so they're used to change, they're used to disruption, they're used to innovation. Um, but to the point that it's now embedded into our culture, um, there was a Facebook post um, a couple of months ago from one of our EMTs and paramedics, it was on our internal site. Um, and it was a picture of a guy watering plants outside um, while it was raining. And it's because they talked to that patient. They said, what matters to you right now? Um, he's like, well, I need to water my plants. And they're like, well, it's wet. You're going to fall. Let me go do that for you. Let's just prevent that from happening. I'm going to water your plants right now, just so you don't get out there when it's wet and slippery and fall. Love that. And I will say just uh, to tag on to what uh, Brandon said, that was one of the sort of tips is that you need to share those wins, right? The people need to see the fruit of their labors. And so I think they've done a really great job of doing that along the their journey and, and path of integrating this. Yeah, I, I think that often when we're talking about improvement initiatives, the psychology of change can be overlooked. And it's one of the most important factors is getting that group's commitment, not one step above buy-in even to have them push towards this common goal. And Dr. Camp, you touched on this in the beginning and I, I wanna call it out and Brandon, I know that you all live this model. I'm a total improvement science nerd over here. I've got my improvement guide, my data improvement guide, and now I have quality as an organizational strategy behind me. Um, but I think for those who are just starting off their quality improvement initiatives who might want to take on a project like this, it's worth giving a high level talk about how does the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Model, help with some innovation like this? Yeah, I, you know, I think the IHA and the John A. Hartford Foundation did a really great job of providing those tools of helping people identify what the problem is. And, and I think that, you know, is what Brandon shared, being able to show the impact and change, the reduction in the falls, the cost savings associated with it. So they do provide a toolkit and a lot of worksheets that sort of give that sort of understanding of, as you said, the general, you know, why, why are we doing this? But the more that you can put data 
data behind it, the better. And so obviously that does take, uh, again, getting a little buy-in from leadership. So if you have some of those tech people behind the scenes that can help you with that, um, I think collecting some data in advance is very important. Absolutely. And I think we'll go ahead and transition into the results now. I could talk about methods all day because I think this is such, there's so many important aspects of why this program was successful. And it, it's it, it's nice and packaged into a manuscript, but when you really think about all those things that happened, it's monumental work. Uh, but all in all, throughout this program, there were over 45,000 adults um, and about half of them were screened for the risk of falls. So Brandon, I'm curious from your frontline perspective, um, what were some, was this, first of all, was this number good enough? Was it what you expected? Or what were some of the challenges you experienced with getting patients to be screened? Um, so the, the number one challenge is um, the, the first question that we have built out there ahead of that stay independent questionnaire is, is the patient awake alert and can answer this question? Um, if they click yes, it populates the rest of the questionnaire. Um, some of the other challenges that we had seen is it may have not been clinically appropriate to be going through a fall risk screening. If, if they're having you know an acute MI, we don't wanna be talking about this right this moment. We can do that at a follow-up visit, right? Um, and then um, just situationally, is, is this an appropriate conversation to have right now? Um, I was impressed with the 50% um, when we first did the look back on this, I would love to see that go higher, but I think there's some more work to do around what are the barriers um, to having this done on, you know, 75% at least. Yeah, and I think having your operational definition of who's eligible or who should be screened is often a moving target and important to continue to refine. In traditional research, we get so stuck on you have to keep the thing the same forever and ever, but in improvement science, as you learn, you can iterate. And I think that this project is one that helps us set up for future iteration and understanding your points are, are really important about not all patients probably should be screened. It's probably inappropriate for some. Um, so definitely refining that, that definition if we want to shoot for 100 or noting that 50% is what was achieved in this program as other programs look to replicate should be looking at uh, similar achievable success. Also, it struck me that of those who were screened, almost 60% actually met the criteria for at risk of falls. And that to me felt really high. I don't know about to you, but there's a huge population that may have not been previously identified. Yeah, I think that's a really good point in the fact that um, oftentimes uh, older adults don't want to have that discussion about falls because as soon as they bring it up, somebody's going to say, oh, you're no longer safe to live independently. And, um, you know, so being able to, again, go in and do this uh, with someone that maybe they trust. I think somebody, you know, typically is going to trust that emergency medical responder. And maybe, again, that's it's very enlightening. And I know from delivering home health services myself, it's always very uh, enlightening um, to see them in that environment. So um, I think, again, yeah, they were definitely able to tap on uh, people um, again, that gives more clarity to what ch challenges and struggles that they're having lending to falls. Absolutely. And also among the falls, an innovative criteria that you all used um, that I, I had not seen applied in the pre-hospital setting previously was the look at medications role in potential for falls. And you all use the beers criteria. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about what these criteria are, and almost half of the patients were using medications that could potentially be inappropriate or contribute to a risk of falling. Yeah, the BEERS criteria is definitely uh, is a tool that we teach our students um, and our clinicians use that really identifies those uh, medications that are at highest risk for older adults and, and sort of, you know, flags them in a sense just to sort of um, bring awareness that, you know, first of all, that medication may be one that's lending risk and or even combined with another medication that elevates that risk level. So it just gives you that, that sort of pause for you to consider, is there something 
something alternative that we should use or, the, you know, is there an opportunity uh, for maybe deprescribing? Um, and this is where we were probably most impressed with uh, MedStar was their ability to implement this into the EMR. So it became sort of an automated process, right? You didn't have to really train to that tool. And so just like it does in our electronic health record, where we get flagged when there's a medication that may be at risk for this individual, um, it gives you an alert. So we were pretty impressed that they were able to integrate this and then even keep up with the sort of annual updates to this. Yeah, Brandon, perhaps you could speak a little to what that implementation was like. I'm sure it was no easy feat or an overnight fix. Oh, no, no. Our uh, our health information and health health records manager, I think he was going to pull his hair out by the time we got to the end of this piece. It, it took probably 40 hours of, of work to do that initial build. And it's, it's going in and flagging every medication, every potential formulary for that medication um, with the warning and um with with the actions that should be done um and so luckily that that initial build is done um and now that we're doing the annual updates it's, it's probably five to ten hours um but it's very impactful and it does you know raise that awareness of not just our mobile integrated health paramedics but the emts and paramedics that are out on the ambulance um it, it's given them that information and raising their awareness to uh, you know the potentially inappropriate medications that that could lead to a fall in an older adult yeah, it is incredibly impactful to find a 48% positive screening rate for that. It seems like definitely something worth paying attention to as we think about what are what are the drivers behind falls and repeat falls and, and what can we potentially do to connect with the right resources. I do want to highlight a second measure that is probably my favorite and one of my favorites that I've ever seen in a study is a patient-centered look. So perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about what you all observed with your intervention in terms of the before and after on that quality of life intervention. And, and maybe first we can talk a little bit about what those quality of life dimensions were. There was a question from the audience about the, the Euroqual in general, uh, but this to me is, is the table from the paper. Sure, yeah. So we do use the Euroqual assessment for quality of life. Um, and like I said before, we do that measurement while they're at enrolled on that first day of enrollment. And then once they graduate from the program, we're going to reassess their quality of life. Um, and so this tool looks at five dimensions. Um, it looks at their mobility, um, scales one to three. It looks at their ability to take care of them, their, to, to perform self-care. It looks at their ability to perform usual activities. Um, it asks about pain and discomfort, as well as anxiety and depression. And all of those are on a scale of one to three. And so we get that initial measurement you know, once they are enrolled in the program, and then we repeat it once they graduate, so that we can show that there was a change in those five dimensions. Um, and then for the overall health status, that's on a scale of, of 1 to 100, we indexed it on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, just how do you feel about your health today on that day of enrollment? Um, and then, you know, we work with them for that 30 to 90 days, doing those proactive home visits, getting them connected to resources, getting them, you know, getting them appointments with primary care, getting their medications, getting their medications, you know, looked at or adjusted. Um, and then we repeat that. How do you feel about your health today? And, and you know, they're, they're reporting a 29.5% improvement in their perception of their overall health, which is quite remarkable. That is quite remarkable indeed. And I see we've got a question from one of our panelists, Dr. Toon, welcome. Thank you. So as being a geriatric by age definition. Older adult. <laughs> I'm a geriatric, let's call it what it is. Now, I understand that and I appreciate that. So I'm curious about, have you looked, uh, this relates to this and I'm gonna, uh, I'll tie it in. Um, do your providers write in every medication on the EPCR that they use? Because that's often, sometimes these patients have humongous list. Sure. And so as part of um, our initial visits, we are gathering up every single medicine that they have in the house, and we're going to write it all down. Um, so that, that would be with the MIH that, that do would that, be not, the the field, not the field personnel. Right, right. Um, typically, the field uh, EMT, the 911 EMT is in paramedics. They're, they're at the... Uh, they're at the mercy of whatever is given to them at the time of the 911 call. Um, typically, we have a little bit more time with them in that uh, home visit setting where we can go over the medications and then work with primary care to do a medication reconciliation. Okay. And then 
did you look at how many referrals did you receive from your providers in this field directly versus through other mechanisms? You know, people that actually filled out the assessment score and stuff. Uh, I'm curious again about that. How, what's the level of activity from the 911 providers into this versus what is gathered by the alert system? You know, are you are you getting referrals, and if so, how high is it or percentage is it? Sure, I, I don't know that number off the top of my head as as far as who alerted to be an at risk for a falls or who had a potentially inappropriate medication prescribed and did that result in a referral. I have that information, just not off the top of my head. I do know that um, here today we get ten to fifteen referrals from our crew members per day, um, and, and a lot of it is driven off of these alerts and and different um, system changes that we've made. All right, very good. Thank you. I, yeah, I think this is fantastic. And the 29% increase in perception of one's overall health status is a huge difference. And I think it might be tempting to wonder, oh, these things probably aren't all related or an intervention just looking at reducing falls may not have an effect on some of these other areas of life. But to see all of the measures move in the same direction is huge, especially around things like anxiety and depression, where some folks may be feeling isolated or afraid to do some of their normal or their favorite activities just because of uh, fear of falling and, and going to the hospital. Um, but I also want to move into another measure that's less patient centered. But if we're talking about from an organizational perspective and getting that commitment from some of our leadership, money is a powerful motivator, as we know. Uh, so perhaps you all could talk with us a little bit about what you saw in terms of the cost savings related to this program and, and the in the high utilization group and in the hospital readmission. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we talked about, we did track the utilization a year before they were enrolled to a year after. And so we were able to show that there was you know, an about 50% reduction in EMS responses um, related, 50% um, reduction before and after the intervention or before and after you know, the, the program that they were enrolled in. Um, and so we just um, took those numbers, um, said, this is how much Medicare is paying for a 419, for an ambulance, $419. Um, this is how many patients would have been transported um, and then here's the hospital readmission rates. And so we've just multiplied that out and, and we're able to illustrate and demonstrate a cost savings to the healthcare system just based on, on that 90 day intervention. And it's no small number. So any agency, any organization that's looking, times are tough, resources are limited. Here's a, a huge population that's at risk of really poor outcomes and an added benefit of not only do you increase quality of care and quality of life, but you can save the system true resources here. Right. And, and so for the 30 day readmission avoidance program, you know, we were able to avoid those patients are the highest of the high risk for readmissions. Like they are 100% expected to be readmitted to the hospital within that 30 day window. Um, and so we, we were able to avoid that 317 times, you know, or 83.2% per, of the time they did not go back to the hospital during that 30 day period, um, which is a pretty remarkable cost savings, um, uh, 15,000 per patient enrolled. Um, and the cost of delivering this program is, is way under that. <laughs> $4.9 million. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that is a huge savings. Uh, so now we've made it through the tables. I want to open it up to all of our panelists for a few final questions in the remaining time. Jeff, I'll kick it to you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely super amazing results. And it's clear that you put a lot of hard work and a lot of efforts into achieving these results. It certainly didn't come overnight and very carefully planned. I was wondering, um, it, it seems like the role of MIH is so critical in driving many of these outcomes, particularly on the cost saving side. I was wondering how MIH, how these patients link back to 911 calls, since I imagine some of these folks are still calling 911, but perhaps they're less likely to be transported. Is that something that the dispatchers or the 911 EMTs and paramedics would know that these patients are enrolled in these programs and perhaps they go out of their way to try to keep them on scene, whereas a typical patient, they're trying, you know, within 10 minutes or so, are you, are you coming or are you staying? Whereas right. right. Ones yeah, maybe so, um, a bit longer 
So for yeah. all of the patients, for all of the patients that we have enrolled in one of these programs, um, I think we're up to 2,500 now that are currently enrolled that we're, you know, we're currently working with. Um, they're all flagged in our in our computer aided dispatch center in our communication center by uh, name, address, and phone number. And so, if any of those match, they get a special response. Um, so, if they call nine one one, they're going to get that tailored emergency response. They're still going to get the ambulance, but one of our mobile integrated health paramedics will be assigned to that call as well, just so that we can go out to there um, with the ambulance, talk to the patient, see what's going on, and then provide patient centric care options at the time of the 911 call, which is not always going to the ER. Um, a lot of patients don't want to go to the ER, but we're able to help navigate them to a more appropriate resource. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really good to hear. And I figure that definitely having sort of a two-way communication of sorts with both the MIH and 911 teams helps out a lot. Um, talking a bit more about this hospital readmission avoidance program, I know that preventing falls is a, a big deal in hospital too, that of course, hospitals don't want their patients falling. Um, it definitely looks bad for them. That's considered an adverse event. And these folks eventually are going to be discharged home. And maybe some of these are the hospital readmit, readmission avoidance MIH program patients. I was wondering if your MIH programs work with the hospitals um, on these patients that are already fall risk per se, not so much um, the medical issues. I mean, a lot of these hospital readmission avoidance might be congestive heart failure or other medical conditions, but uh, just focusing in on the fall risks, if that's something that's communicated pretty well from the hospitals to MIH. Sure. I, I know like right now we're not partnered with the hospitals to do fall risk prevention mm -hmm. alone. I know the Fort Worth Fire Department is um, on, on some of the uh, some of the patients and some of the hospital systems in our area. Um, and as we work towards that merging of the Fort Worth Fire Department and MedStar, I imagine we're going to be able to grow that portion of it a lot more. Absolutely. Yeah. I could see that. And that kind of leads to my next question um, in terms of falls versus lift assist. I know that's a term that's pretty common in fire and EMS where sort of falls being I've fallen and I'm hurt versus lift assist falls without a injury or without a claimed injury. Um, I was wondering if you could speak briefly about these calls and whether our um, if you're only going on fall with injuries, or if you know much about how this program may have impacted lift assists as well, or if that's pretty hard to tell from your... Right now, it's pretty hard to tell. Um, as we, you know, again, move forward with this merger, um, I imagine I'll be able to get my hands on some of that data. But um, as it stands now, the lift assist only calls are routed to the fire department, um, and an ambulance response um, is not is not resulted if it's just a lift assist. Fair enough, definitely makes sense. But we're excited to see that data. I'm sure it's had an impact on their side too, but hard to really know for now. But really well, exciting to see. All I that. think that's a key place to highlight a potential future partnership too. Is as part of the lift assist, lift assist protocol, can this screening approach be implemented? Is it easy enough to have as part of the refusal process of transport? In you know, oh I'm you know, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with doing the lift assist, but I'd be more comfortable if I knew an MIH provider would follow up with you later this week. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that would be a perfect ideal state as we move forward. Um, and I, I would love to see that happen, just become standard practice of here's a lift assist. Let's go over these few questions with you and let's make a referral to the MIH team for follow up. Absolutely. I'm also very curious about, since this was an improvement science approach, and there's often these, these PDSAs or the, the cycles of change and the tests of change, I would love to hear from each of you on what were the lessons learned or what would you share with others who are, are setting out on this? Is there anything, to, any pitfall to avoid or anything that worked particularly well in your PDSAs that you would say 100% go for this? Um, so I can start with you, Brandon, and then we'll go to you, Dr. Kemp. Yeah, so when we first rolled this out back in 2018, we we tried really hard to have a pathway for 
you know, resource referrals. So as we are identifying needs in the home, needs related to preventing fall risk, what is that pathway? What does that workflow look out? Who are we referring this to? Um, and it was, to be frank, it was a mess. Uh, we just we, we had to test it, and we we did those those, um, you know those those tests of change. Um, and we we started getting feedback from our crews. What what's working? What isn't working? Who are the partners that are responsive? Who can we refer to and ensure that it's going to get done? Um, and so that was probably one of the first PDSA cycles that we did was in was around who are we referring these patients to for those community resources, um, and we were able to clean that up. Um, and get better direction for our team members who are out doing this, this screening each and every day. Very important part of this is, is thinking about the who else needs to know and assembling the improvement team. Uh, often one of the more challenging components, thinking about the change is easy, but doing it is hard is a common phrase that we use. But I think that's an important lesson that you just shared is uh, making sure that the partnerships are there and, and where are we going to send people and, and have the best results. Dr. Kent, what are your thoughts on Pieces of advice, words of wisdom yeah. going into this. Well, and I will say that the sort of discussion and training on the use of the Plan Do Study Act came very early, right? Because we all, you know, always have a great plan, but things don't always go to plan. And so, and, you know, bringing that down to that it doesn't have to be a big problem or, you know, you really want to continually be measuring that as you go along the way and getting the input and, you know, small changes can have a big impact. And especially when you address those early on. So, um, you know, Brandon has that insight specifically to the challenges or the changes that they implemented, but, you know, having that plan in place where anybody can speak up and maybe give some, and maybe even asking for it so that you can adjust changes as you go along and not wait till, you know, the final data collection and try and think what went wrong, though, why didn't we get the outcomes we wanted, so. Oh, that really resonates with me, the, the waiting until you find out at the very end. I think that's where the, the Plan Do Study Act cycles are very powerful, If you, especially if you start on a small scale and let it go wrong on a small scale first uh, before department-wide rollouts of protocols that end up needing adjusted. Uh, yeah. Such an important lesson. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that probably one of the most important things that they've exemplified with their initiative is how this really was going to that upstream effect, right? You know, normally we think of MedStar and the fire department as being very reactive, but I think there's great opportunities within both of these, you know, emergency responder services um, to think how do we take this and make it and be more proactive? How do we prevent the falls that need lift assistance? How do we prevent the rehospitalizations because of poor management? So I think, yeah, this is, these are programs that have great opportunity to be in that sort of preventive healthcare space. Absolutely. And the, the role of prevention is often hard to see, but I love that you all put together a family of measures that can really quantify what EMS's value was in this intersection at, we talk about the intersection of public safety, healthcare, and public health, but this is truly demonstrating that upstream public health approach. Yeah. Jeff. Speaking of that public health approach and prevention, um, we know that these patients who were ultimately enrolled in the MIH program certainly had great results. But I'm thinking about the patients who maybe weren't candidates for the MIH program and those patients who did screen positive and who did have beers criteria um, medications, but they didn't get that follow up from the MIH paramedic. I was wondering what your thoughts were in terms of what you did or maybe what you're planning to do or sort of advice on reaching those patients since of course, can't really reach everyone. I mean, community paramedics have a lot that they're doing um, and there's a lot of high-risk patients. So in terms of maybe those partnerships with primary care, kind of providing that warm handoff, if you have any thoughts on um, how we can help that very large population that's risky, but maybe not super, super, super high risk where they're in the MIH pool. Sure. You see, yeah. So I think that is a definite opportunity to increase the impact of this kind of initiative. Um, but it, it does come down to scalability um, because as you saw, you know, we're screening 50,000, 60,000 patients a year, and then over half of those are screening positive. How do we 
work with other community partners and other organizations in the community in a HIPAA compliant manner to get those patients, you know, the resources that they need. Um, and so maybe I imagine, you know, a patient screens positive, maybe they don't have any of the other risk factors with a potentially appropriate medications, or maybe they're a, a low risk positive. Um, is there an opportunity to, you know, get that information over to the primary care automatically somehow? Um, is there an opportunity to work with a hospital system who may have capacity to do additional outreach or with the health science center who may have capacity to do some additional in-home outreach on some of those patients? It's, it's going to take a community approach. Um, we, we can't do it all because th that's a lot of patients that we need to be seeing. Even though we proved the value of this, you know, it, it still need to come up with a scalable way to address, you know, the, the broader um, problem in the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it definitely looks like you're moving in the right direction and getting there. That not an easy fight, uh, but definitely very promising to see all this. Yeah, and I would say them sharing the the results of this not only with the hospitals but even primary care providers to see the value of how um, you know connecting their these programs uh, with their patients that are maybe at higher risk, um, and then you know for providers to see these kind of outcomes, that gives us the why to share with patients. You know, I really want you to consider uh, engaging in this program because they're going to provide you that extra layer of support in the home and things of that sort. So in order to get sort of buy-in um, as well, I think um, that that helps with that adherence and that even acceptance because, you know, MIH is totally volunteer, right? If that um, person wants to be engaged or not. So for them to hear it from their physician or fear it from the hospital's caseworker, I think that gives an, a little extra seed. Definitely. And making the primary care provider aware, a lot of times they're not aware how many times EMS was summoned or that a person's been enrolled in a program like this. So I love that, that conversation around interoperability. I know we're getting close to the end, but I think we've got time for one or two more questions. So Bill, I'll toss it to you. Thank you. So I know we're finishing up. I do want to thank you. This was a great uh, study to read through this and uh, see where it goes in the future and everything. Um, and it is an area that I think that EMS needs to enhance its knowledge in in general and its pra clinical practice since we know the population of 65 and older is rapidly growing. I'm amazed at 85 and older and how rapidly that population is growing. So I think there's an enhanced need to make sure uh, these individuals, which now it does include myself, receive this kind of help. I'm curious, uh, do you know how many EDs that you transport to are geriatric ready EDs? And are you familiar with that process? I am not familiar with that. Uh, Dr. Kemp, are you familiar with I've not heard the term geriatric ready as much as I've heard age friendly kind of ready um, and preparedness, but uh, but you're right, those numbers are climbing. So there's a lot of focus and attention on how are we going to address these um, needs going forward. Yes, there is a process that's out there that you can find that addresses uh, EDs that are choosing their level, it's voluntary of uh, their uh, level of preparedness for these patients. And I think there's three different le levels that, if I'm not mistaken, you can probably find it on ASEP's page. But uh, it's something that's out there, uh, I think, and that is uh, very promising. And again, it just shows how complex the whole process is and uh, for this age population that's coming up. But thank you again very much. Love the paper. Looking forward to uh, seeing more out of all of this and sharing it with the greater community. Yes. Thank you. And I have the... Uh unenviable task of wrapping us up on time, but I do want to give the authors a moment um, to share any last thoughts before I take us out. So I'm curious from you all in terms of any last key takeaway that you want to share or a thought on how to sustain this program beyond its initial beginning or, or any advice for anybody else who might want to take on one of these programs in their own community. Uh, so I will start with you, Brandon. Yeah, absolutely. Um and so my, my advice would be start somewhere. Um, don't don't just uh, be complacent or, or sit on the sidelines. And as they suggested, you know, there are more and more people becoming older adults each and every day. Um, and, and it's going to become 
more of a public health type um, epidemic with, with the older adults falling. And so I think we need to be more proactive in our approach as emergency responders. Um, like we've talked about today, we're in the homes. We're there. We, we're, we see what's going on. We have the ability to do these screenings and we have the ability to, if we can't do the follow-up, we can refer that out to someone else who can. And so that would be my advice is, is start somewhere um, and, and start now and, and just take a more proactive approach to how we're delivering healthcare in our communities. I love that. Avoid the analysis paralysis. Get started. Thank you very much for joining us, Brandon. And Dr. Camp, any last thoughts, words of wisdom, next steps? Yeah, just very simply, I think uh, collaboration would be it. You know, you can't always have everyone under your roof. And so not all those areas of expertise or lenses. So really reach out into your community, think about where your gaps are and maybe the input you want and just reach out because somebody else may have that same interest and have a benefit of supporting your program and initiative. I love that. Getting out of our silos and, and breaking them down and connecting, that is key. Well, thank you both again, not only for sharing your time with us today. I know you both have extraordinarily full plates and we really do appreciate that, but for taking on the effort to publish this kind of project. It is no easy feat to go through peer review and we so greatly appreciate having the opportunity to learn from the work that you all did. Uh, and I have to carry us out now. Unfortunately, time flies when you are learning about really exciting programs. Uh, but for our audience, as a reminder, we've got the educational version of the Journal Club podcast on Friday, October 25th. And we will be back here with the clinical podcast in November. This will be on November 18th. Thank you all again for joining us, for your great participation. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this PCRF Journal Club. Please share it with other interested EMS professionals. An archive of past journal clubs can be found at pcrfpodcast.org. You can also find us on Facebook at PCRF at UCLA and on our website, prehospitalcare.org. A special thank you to our sponsors, Limmer Education, providing educational tools for success at every stage of your EMS journey. And ESO, dedicated to improving community health and safety through the power of data. Mm -hmm.